Namo Buddha. Questions and answers. I'll try to address some of these topics from my perspective, from my point of view. Bob, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, three very nice, succinct questions. The first two, are monks like yourself free or freer from dukkha than laymen? And the second question, does the high level of interrupt in contemporary life, electronic and otherwise, make it mandatory to go on retreat to find liberation? No and no to both those questions. Let me elaborate, if I can. Monks, no, are not free from dukkha. Dukkha is suffering. Our goal in this practice, this practice of meditation, um, this practice of keeping moral virtue, uh, with a view to developing wholesome mind states, and reducing unwholesome mind states is to free ourselves from suffering within this lifetime. So this is the monastic goal and this is also the lay person's goal and the point or you use the word liberation, the basis behind liberation, freedom from suffering. Are monks free or freer from suffering? Until you attain liberation, you will never be free from suffering. All conditioned things are suffering. Even the things we like, even the things we love and hold dear to ourselves will be lost and become uh, so. This is the Four Noble Truths. There is suffering, the cause of suffering, an end to suffering, and this path leading to the end of suffering. This path being the practice I just mentioned, meditation, moral virtue. The cause of suffering is what has to be understood and dealt with in our practice in order to reduce suffering. And of course, our suffering will reduce as the practice continues. But nobody is free from suffering until they have reached that goal and actually attained to Nibbana. But of course our degrees of suffering can be measured, but then to what scale are we measuring our degrees of suffering? You can look at the expression, there's always someone worse off than you but that person can also see someone is suffering more than they are. So you get into dangerous water if you try to measure how much you are suffering. We are all suffering without even knowing we're suffering. We could be having a wonderful and fantastic time and then suddenly we're unable to have that same experience. This could be immense suffering, more so as a result of the wonderful time we were having. But say we were having a really horrible time <laughs> and that experience ended, we would see, consider that as being free from suffering. Yet it is the same situation, a change of circumstance. So what we need to change is our perspective, our view of the circumstance we find ourselves in. If you're a monk, well I can assure you if you're a monk you will find there's a lot to be attributed, or a lot you can consider as being suffering. Uh, we have uh, many uh, practices, many rules and many traditions we adhere to um, which are conducive to our practice but at first sight to somebody who's not used to that would be considered as some form of torture. But of course it's not, because we have the understanding through the development of wisdom, 
slowly over a long time and with this practice how to see suffering from a different perspective and actually find the relief the uh, direction on the path towards freedom from suffering from that understanding and in terms of lay life monastic life the reason one becomes a monk or a nun or a renunciant and leaves regular daily life uh, the uh, what do they call it the, the rat race in the west you know working each day to pay the bills to pay the rent to make the boss richer you know this whole going around in a hamster wheel circle race kind of thing that we call in uh, Buddhism and in the Pali language samsara the reason we uh, um, become monks or monastics is to avoid that uh, to some extent um, and give ourselves freedom and time to practice but it doesn't end there because you will soon find that all of our hindrances towards our practices the distractions actually also come from within so although what we're looking for our peace our serenity our tranquility and calm is to be found within and not throughout our external experiences of seeing hearing smelling tasting and touching and thinking it is this thinking that is the root cause of all problems desire desire greed for more uh, hatred or ill will disliking for things we don't want and just general confusion delusion greed hatred and delusion these root defilements are what the monastic has chosen to fight but without disguise without distraction face them look them in the eye and say hmm I'm just gonna meditate through this so it's a direct approach but that doesn't mean that as a lay person you're at a disadvantage because it isn't a, a case of the amount of time you spend in practice of course sila the moral aspect the keeping of moral virtue should be adhered to by all practitioners monastic or lay all of the time but of course as lay people working you cannot be meditating for as many hours as maybe a monk can but then there are many monks with many duties who don't have much time either it does not mean you cannot find liberation distractions from electronic and otherwise whether you have those modern day devices or whether we were in the olden days and we had books there have always been distractions if you have nothing and you're on a desert island in fact in this forest there is very little but these squirrels here I'm watching them again they're a distraction I've put some little fruits I've hung on the tree and I'm hoping they're going to come down and eat them um, or take them away you know there's no electronic devices okay I have this but I only use it for this really um, you soon find distractions this isn't a new thing this is not a world all of a sudden of technology where you can no longer become liberated in fact you have much more opportunities to be in touch with the Dharma like this and through other uh, Buddhist talks and what do you call them channels and things websites access to books and things which I'm going to talk about as well in a minute is it mandatory to go on retreat to find liberation so no it isn't now of course it's nice to have this as a break as part of your practice if you can and locally to you there are sources availability to go on retreats or even on your own at home take some time out to just put some more intensive practice in that is of course an advantage it means you can really work on your practice in your meditation so I hope that helps and I wasn't too distracted by the squirrels you see when I was making these videos in busy 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 India I complained about distractions and interruptions and noises 
Now I'm in the perfect conditions, without distractions, without interruptions, and without noises. What is this mind doing? This mind is making distractions and interrupting me with things it's seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. This is how our minds work, and this is what we learn. This is the practice. But it's not about trying to stop that, it's about knowing that that is how the mind works. When you know, then you can let go. You can say, why am I distracted by this? Ah, it's because I have a desire for that. So if I know that that is unsatisfactory, then this desire will reduce, and then next time it comes along, you'll be less distracted by it. I hope that makes sense. Try it. And, oh, sorry, and your third question, how are you addressed? <clears throat> well, I'm glad, glad you asked this question. Now that I'm in Thailand, for the time being, and this is to be determined, all things are uh, uncertain. My nai is that my nai, I pronounced it incorrectly to an Ajahn here. He did pronounce it correctly, and I'm sh sh not sure I can say it. My nai, the uh, sort of founder of this Thai forest, Ajahn, or reviver of this, well, down a lineage from Ajahn Man, the reviver of this Thai forest tradition, used this expression, my nai, unsure, everything's uncertain. Yes, like a Nietzsche, everything is uncertain. I transfer, I translate in my view, I translate a Nietzsche, which is um, impermanence. Often I translate that as uncertainty. Because impermanence is a little bit uncertainty too, isn't it? So yes, my future is uncertain always, whether I was in India, in England, here. I don't know how I arrive at any of these places. I am fortunate my conditions are in place for me to seem to arrive in these beautiful situations. And there he goes again, distracted this time by a dog, but he's in, in robes this colour. So I thought it was a, one of my brother monastics who are rare to see around here. It's very peaceful. And there, here I am. Oh, so what am I addressed? How am I addressed? Sorry. Well, officially my name is Bhante, these are Pali words, Bhante, Dharma, Rakita, Bhikkhu. Bhante just means the Pali word for venerable. Uh, and Dharma, Rakita means Dharma, as in this, the teachings of the Buddha, the Dharma. And Rakita means protected by. So my name means protected by the Dharma. You haven't actually answered this question, Bob, asked this question, Bob. I'm waffling on explaining, but this is the background. So, Dharma Rakita, protected by the Dharma. You're given these names at your um, first ordination as a Samanera, and this is when you give up your old name. And here in Thailand, and I think by chance in India, you get the same initial Dharma, D, as your given name. <clears throat> it was just pure luck that I got my given name initial D in India because they don't do that there, but here they would. Uh, anyway, Dharma Rakita Bhikkhu, and Bhikkhu just means um, uh, fully ordained Buddhist monk, uh, or specifically homeless men mendicant, alms mendicant. Uh, oh, I forgot that right, yes, I think so. So that's my full name. So. Generally speaking, I would be addressed worldwide in all languages in all countries as just Bante. And this could be either Bante Dharma Rakita, because in India they like long, long names and saying Bante Dharma Rakita, Bhikkhu. You know, it's a big rolling of the tongue, expressional sign of respect. Or Bante Dharma Rakita, Bhikkhu, like all this. But, you know, in the West we kind of like shorter little epithets, ni names. So you often hear monks referred to as Bante letter, a letter. I could be Bante D, that's good. Or just Bante if there's no other monks around. You know, there's often the case you're not going to be in the presence of more than one. <laughs> and if you're talking to me, you can call me whatever you like. I really don't mind. Um, venerable or Bante. But here in Thailand, which I think is rather nice, is they keep, they call you your given name. And their generally given names are quite short, like Po or Ajahn Cha, for instance. Cha was not his 
um, monastic Pali name, Cha was his given name. My given name is Daniel, shortened to Dan most often. My, pet, my mother, my father, they call me my sister, they call me Dan. Um, and here, uh, I was, before I became a monk in India, I was an Anagarika, which is a white clothed person at a monastery, so I was Anagarika Dan. So now I'm back to Pra Dan. Gosh, I, you asked a simple question, what a complicated answer I'm giving, I'm sorry. That, which is P-R-A. Now this is in Thailand how, instead of Bante. So if you say Bante here, they don't really recognize that word, what it means. Um, it's a bit, it's a bit official. Maybe, maybe in the city monasteries they might, uh, up north, I'm not sure. But here, uh, you can be called Pra, which just means venerable. So I'm Pra Dan. And there's another funny little name that someone calls me here called Long P. You may have heard the term Long Po, which is a very senior monastic. And in central Thailand here, I've learnt since this visit, that very junior monastics um, that are old, like me, are called Long P. <laughs> but that's too confusing. So just Pra, Pra Dan. And Pradhan is easy to remember, easy to say, and I'm going to stick with that one because, um, you know, people say, what's your name? And Bante, Dharma, it's all such an ex like I've just explained. Now, from now on, just Pradhan. And why did you want to become a monk? To be happy. There we are. That's two very long answers I normally give, reduced to their lowest and simplest denominator. I'm Pradhan. And I became a monk to be, be happy. How about that? So, Bob, that's only the first question. What's the time? Oh dear. Uh, now, Marina has asked me several questions, but one of the one I wanted to cover here is um, just about books. What books do I recommend? You know, what I recommend is don't read too much. There's a danger in overthinking what is a very simple teaching. The Buddha's teachings are simple. Now the industry, well my preference in fact, uh, I'm not a great reader and I've chosen the practice side of Buddhism or being a monk rather than the intellectual side of Buddhism being a monk. You get different kinds, working monks, intellectual monks, practice monks. I'm more a practice monk and the forest tradition is that way inclined. In fact, when you first go to a monastery, they take all your books away. They allow you the library, but they see which book you're taking out, which book you're, you know, they're, they're controlling your reading. For a very good reason, um, you need to remain focused on your practice. For the Buddha said, um, you, um, sorry, <clears throat> the Buddha said, uh, all all the answers and all you need to know, what you need to learn, can be found in this fathom length bag of skin and bones and liquids and sinews. It's all here. So we have in this body, this fathom length body, our thinking mind and all of the feelings physically and senses that we're interpreting with our thinking minds. This is what we should be reading and this is the practice of meditation. This is where we learn about suffering. We learn about the cause of suffering and how to reduce or end suffering. So he didn't say, go and read this book, go and read that book. Of course, there weren't them there and then. But even so, I think this is what he would do now. He would say, don't read too much. But what you should read, if you can, when you can, um, if you're having any reading material, are the suttas. You can begin with the Majjhima Nikaya, which is the middle length discourses of the Buddha, because the suttas from the Pali Canon are the words of the Buddha. Now, they can seem to be quite long and go on, but if you get used to reading them, you can kind of speed read them a little bit more quickly because everything's repeated three times. So, of course, you don't need to read each line three times. So, if you're a lazy reader like me, who skips to the end of the book, you'll, you can go a little, little, quite quickly through, but these suttas are very well directed to all manner of kinds of people, which is how the Buddha taught. And these are the Buddha's words. So that's the first 
port of call for reading material. Then my preference is really biographies, biographies of monks, senior monks, dead and alive, and uh, I find them easy to read, interesting, but very applicable to the practical side of Buddhism, not only in monastic life, but in, in ordinary life. One of my favorite books, um, and there are many biographies, but I'm not going to list them all, and to some extent my form of entertainment would be, although I've kind of run out of them now, would be, uh, I'm not supposed to have entertainment, but if I had any, it's reading biographies of, of monastics, because they are so interesting, and also they, I can relate to them because I'm having the same experiences, albeit later on, in a different generation, but in a tradition which remains quite unchanged. So, I would recommend certainly the book called uh, Still Flowing Water. I can't say I'm going to put some link in here, I have no idea how to do that, so I'll just say it slowly. Still Flowing Water, this is the biography of Ajahn Chah, written by Ajahn Jayasaro, Jayasaro, J A Y. A S A R O. So it's the biography of Ajahn Chah, but still flowing water. It's freely available. You can find it on the internet. It's freely available uh, in EPUB or PDF, any of these formats, and also free as an audio book. It's a very big book. If you get the actual book, it's this, this thick, this big. So great to have it on your phone or device these days, and it's great to listen to as well. It's beautifully read by Ajahn Jayasaro, I think, himself. And Ajahn Jayasaro is one of, he lives in Thailand, he's from England, from, in fact, very close to where I'm from, the Isle of Wight, and where my mother holidays still at the age of 83, twice a year, for one or two weeks. Um, the Isle of Wight, and he's a very um, special uh, example of monasticism himself and a direct disciple of Ajahn Chah. He spent 26 years writing this book so he got it absolutely right. Please read that if you don't read anything ever again that will teach you all about Theravada Buddhism and this Thai forest tradition but it's applicable to each and every person on this planet human that ever lives and it will change your life. The industry standards, however, those other books, and I will mention them, are the, um, uh, uh, so the word of the Buddha, uh, this is by Bhikkhu Nyayamoli, uh, Bhikkhu Nyayamoli, the word of the Buddha. Now this is a collection of bits from the suttas as well as the story of the Buddha's life, all put together. I think I've got that right, I'm not mixing. A lot of these books I've read a long, long time ago. And then the other one is Buddha Dharma, it's called, by Buddha Dasa. And that's one of the first and original books designed for people that ask this question. Does that make sense? So a lot of people ask, what book shall I read to get me into Buddhism? And this is the, one of the first of those books that was available. Now there are many, but those two are the industry standard starter with, along with the Majima Nikaya. So in Majima Nikaya, those two books, and I would read, for sheer enjoyment, Still Flowing Water, Ajahn Chah by uh, Ajahn Jayasaro. Oh, I think, time-wise, I should just go to some short questions now. Um, ASM, I don't know what your proper name is, you've asked me to, this isn't, he's got a very long question which I think I'll address as a separate uh, range of topics, but just to cover the questions you've asked me quickly, um, oh yeah, <clears throat> uh, you'd like me to do some more meditation or do some vi meditation videos, uh, yeah I will once I get a little bit more settled because it's going to require some more time to do that, make those, um, other than, you know, in my own meditation time. So it's, it's the time thing. I know I have a lot of time, but I, I'm, 
that I will be coming to that because it will help me and it will hopefully help you. Um, then you make some references to Tibetan Buddhism, which I'm not familiar. I, I, I'm not familiar with all of the terms even that you've quoted or mentioned in your letter. Um, then I also suggest to you that a lot of the questions that you've asked can be answered in that exactly the same book, Ajahn Chah's uh, Still Flowing Water by Ajahn Jayasaro. Ah, and this is what you mentioned in your thing, that you're coming across where you live in the Tibetan Buddhism tradition and the teachers you're speaking to against, you know, prohibitive costs. Okay, let me say this one thing. All Dharma books are free to everybody, freely given, freely distributed. Uh, if, you're, if you have to pay, then don't bother get another book that's free because you know if you have to pay for it it's it's not real the Buddha well it's not allowed we do not charge um, or they are not charged for even this big book like this Ajahn Jayasara's book beautiful hard cup hard what do you call it hard back book um, it's free okay if you're in a different country from where it's available there may be some postage things or issues but these days online it's free like I mentioned the audio books there's no charge at all and not even any subscriptions necessary or signing on or anything like this. Very simple. By the way, forestsanga.org. You can find all these books, forestsanga.org. And they're a very good website for lots of instructional information. forestsanga.org. So, yeah, anyone asking you to pay for anything, walk away. It's free. The Dharma was given out of compassion for all people by the Buddha. It's not an industry. It's not to be made money from. It doesn't require anything other than sila, samadhi, panya, keeping the precepts. That's what you give. Now, of course, there is dana, giving food to support monastics, and, but this is in order that you can practice generosity and it's reciprocated by the monastics, by them giving that, uh, giving you that opportunity and us sharing with you our experiences of practicing closely with that Dharma. But the Dharma is free. Dharma books are free. Any amount of them. Get them, read them, enjoy them, and then share them, pass them on freely. Okay? So, Yep, so that's, thank you ASM for that, help me remember that, and I will address your other points later on. But I can't address all the points about the Tibetan stuff, because I don't know anything about it, it's not my area. Um, just a quick com thing about this Mahayana Tibetan debate. I heard a very good um, explanation this morning, because I don't think I made it that clear yesterday. Um, uh, an Ajahn, a nun, uh, Bikuni, Italian but in America, thank you. Um, for, I don't know whether you're Ajahn or Venerable these days, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, um, as time goes on, they all become, we all become Ajahns. I'm not, I'm a Pra. Um, oh, my questions have disappeared. Uh, so don't c confuse with all this difference, yes? Um, between different traditions. I mean, the underlying aspect of it all is the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. All of the traditions are dealing with that, the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. Um, so she put it a very good way, or venerable, I should say, put it a very good way. Um, there are many oceans, they say, the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian. They're all different on the surface, but the underlying nature of seawater is salt. And that sums it up beautifully, I think. So thank you for that, Ajahn. If you're not an Ajahn, I apologize, but I'd rather go up than down in referring to other monastics. It says that in my Prafarang little Thai phrase book, especially for monks. <laughs> um, the main difference is... Oh, yeah, so then my explanation. So the main difference um, is the goal, yes? In Theravada Buddhism, the goal is to become enlightened. In Mahayana Buddhism, the goal is to become a Buddha, like our Buddha, and help all beings become enlightened. So, 
I'll leave that to you to decide which is possible, which is easier, which is more achievable. But just to concentrate on becoming enlightened yourself isn't necessarily selfish. Like I've said, mentioned before, if you're stuck in the mud with other people, you need to get out of the mud yourself before you can help them. You can't wait around in the mud hoping you're all going to find a way out. So this is kind of just a repeat going back on yesterday's question or the other day's question with that. So sorry, finally, um, oh yes, and related to that, Matthew says, I believe Theravada is more pragmatic. Well, I think that's beautifully put, Matthew. Yes, I, I would agree. And finally, Creel, uh, interesting, I'm not sure what video you're referring to, but you say, interesting, was food offered daily with no problems? Here, in abundance, yes, no problems at all. The only problem being if you're on your own, as I was for the first three days, so three nights, so that was three mornings, four mornings, three mornings, you can't carry it all. And so you've got to be very careful how far you walk. There's a tendency to just walk up the road and then back down the other side, but you forget if you walk up one side, you collect enough food, on the way back, you're going to get the same amount. It's literally like that. So you've got to walk a road along until your bowl's half full, and then cross the road and walk back, which isn't very far in Thailand. So no problems at all. In India, not quite, it's not the so. Uh, I went on arms round every day in, in the place where I stayed for the Vasa, and I'd get cups of chai bought for me, strange things, put in my bowl uh, that we can't have, so uncooked food for instance. They try to give you money which I won't accept, we cannot accept. Um, incidentally in Nepal as well they, they want to give you money too, it's very difficult not to accept it. They're very upset if you don't, so you don't touch it. I let them put it in, on the tray in my bowl, on my there, and I put it in my bowl with all the other bits they put in there, and then I empty it out at the monastery when I get there. Um, and let the monks there deal with the money if they're going to handle money. But I don't handle money or have anything to do with it. So, uh, yeah, India, uh, but in India though, you can always be fed. There's usually prasad, and it's usually there is one at least in every town that offers food at an appropriate time, so before noon, and gives you enough time to eat it, which is just rice and dal, more or less. So that's why I only ate rice, rice and dal, dal every day, more or less, for three years unless I was at my monastery. If you're in a monastery, again, food comes in in abundance because they know you're there. But if you're wandering around India, people don't know what you're doing. They're more interested in the bowl itself and what it is. They, want, they think it's something they can worship. They think it's a tambal or whatever they call it, a drum. Um, you know, and it, it's putting things in it doesn't cross the mind. So, but here, no problems at all, Creel. So that's the end of, oh, that's the end of the questions for now. I hope I haven't um, gone on too long. Uh, thank you for watching, thank you for listening. If you've subscribed, thank you for subscribing. I hope to keep these videos interesting. I will try and make some guided meditation videos in due course, but it will be in due course because at the moment, once I've made this video, that's it for for this for another day. I'm managing to keep it within an hour of doing everything to do with it as well, you know, getting the phone out of my bag, plugging the wire in, finding a place to sit which is the correct lighting, doing a like hello testing, testing one, two, three, <laughs> once or twice. Um, I don't want ever that to take all more than an hour. Um, the little shorts you see, they don't take any time at all. I always carry this phone uh, <coughs> in my, uh, I don't know what you call this pocket thing that monks have, but uh, you, um, you see those occasionally. Not so many here, because I'm not walking so far out and about. And I'm also in an environment where there are no mobile phones really. E even the lay people here, you never see one, you never hear one. This is the big difference in India. It's all you saw and heard. People taking selfies with you and taking photographs, answering calls, texts. It's a very new thing there, maybe. Here, in the monastery grounds, you do, this is the only one I've seen. Every, I think a couple of monks, junior monks, may have them, but they're quite hidden away. So I'm keeping mine hidden away. 
I'm not using it. I have got some messages have come on this one because I have two. One was one that works here and one that works in India. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, there's no need for me to have them other than to do this. Uh, and uh, I'm keeping it that way. And it's good for the environment, good for the practice. So there'll be a few less of those shorts, but this will continue. And I hope it's useful. If it's useful, then please use it. If it's not, you can just forget about it and ignore it. But uh, any problems finding those books, make comments, because I'm sure it's easier to, for me to just put a uh, comment back to you of how to find the book. Um, if you're interested in looking at those books or any other books, as I say, a good resource is, uh, for finding them is forestsanger.com, if you're in the UK. Well, I'm not sure they'd be happy to be inundated with inquiries. I don't know how it works. It's on the internet, so. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for watching. Anyway, uh, I must stop. Um, so, many blessings with Meta. I'm not in my robes, so I don't do, you know, I can't do chanting blessings. We have to be in our robes for such activities. So I just have to say, sort of, and bye for now. That's the end of this hopefully not too long message. Namo Buddha.